Thank you, Professor Brian Schmidt, the ANU Vice Chancellor. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor for me to get back to uh, Canberra. It's been a while since the last time I visited uh, Canberra. Allow me to uh, mention a few names here. First is uh, Professor Greg Philly, your old friends, and, and uh, great to see you here again. Uh, Professor Helen Sullivan, Dean of NU College of uh, Asia and the Pacific, as well as uh, Ibu Eve Waburton and all uh, the participants who are uh, coming to this annual uh, SDL uh, lecture here. Pahol Hill, hello Pahol Hill. Uh, good to see you. I translated his book, so I, I remember <laughs> Pahol Hill. Yeah, I was still a student at Gajah Mada University when the book about Indonesian economy uh, was out. Anyway, uh, it, it's good to be back and uh, you know, we. I usually came during the Indonesia update session, usually in September. And the last time I came, uh, we were actually discussing the Indonesia Mengajar project at that time. If I'm not mistaken, it was 2012, or 2011, 2012. And uh, we truly benefited from the exchanges uh, at that time. This time, I'm back and uh, thanks to DFAT for having the invite uh, to visit Australia and had the opportunity to uh, visit the NU as well. And this evening, I've been asked to talk about how democracy delivers. And it is a reflection on the case of Indonesia. <clears throat> but if I may uh, also uh, sort of uh, refocus the subject, not only so much on the case of Indonesia, but also on the case of, of Jakarta. Uh, this is an issue that we have been working closely, and I thought of interest uh, to all of us uh, to ensure that democracy can deliver. People's expectations about what government can do and what government should do is quite high nowadays especially with transparencies, uh, openness of information, and there is that widespread uh, belief that an elected leaders in a democratic process should be able to deliver what is expected in the public. And, and you know, we often hear uh, during elections, uh, what are the promises? What are the visions? And I think that is, those are, are important. And I think Indonesia, having free elections since 1999, we have had enough set of uh, period or, or data to say whether or not we're able to deliver. Generally, we're able to deliver. But I'll, I'll explain to you later why it is crucial to make a breakthrough on that aspect. If I may use uh, if I may use a, a, not a PowerPoint, but the Apple ITV, I believe. Is it working? Not yet. Okay. Uh, as as we waited for that. Any further? Let me uh, give you the context. Why? In the discussions of how democracy delivers, there is two big bodies on this issue. One is bureaucracy that has been there for many, many years, and they have been serving series of leaders, and they have the ability to always adjust to the new leaders who are coming in. And sometimes uh, the, the bureaucracy have ways to adjust to the newness that is bring in by newly elected leaders. So on the one hand, you have a bureaucracy. On the other hand, you have a democratic process that produces new leaders, be it mayor, be it governor, be it president or region. So this electoral process and bureaucratic process 
what I've been observing is there's something missing in between. And our reform in the past 25 years focused so much on the democratic aspect of that and not so much on the bureaucratic structure to accommodate political change. Give you one simple illustration. <clears throat> Scheduling, for example. Our election is designed to elect leaders and then to lead government, to lead bureaucracy. The, the budget cycles in the bureaucracy does not fit with the electoral cycles of our political process. To give you an illustration, a president in Indonesia is elected, like last time in 2014, for example. Pak Jokowi was elected and inaugurated in October 2014. The president, the sitting president, Pak Yudhoyono, submitted the budget for 2015 in August, two months before Pak Jokowi inaugurated. And he was already elected in July, actually. So can you imagine, he was elected in July, will be president start in October, and then the sitting president submitted budget in August for the January 2015. So the newly elected president budget plan were actually reflected in the year of 2016. That cycles actually is a problem. Of course, there is a there is budget APBN perubahan. Apa ya? How do I say this perubahan in English? Uh, revisions. But you can only do so much on that revisions. So this is just one example how our bureaucracy and budget cycles and political process were not designed to link. And you can see uh, similar cases uh, at the local level. Like my, exam my, my case, for example, uh, I was inaugurated in October. Same, just a few days uh, in terms of uh, dif difference with the president. And yet, uh, when I started my job, the budget has been in discussion and almost all approved. So I can only start in the following year. So that's one example. The second uh, issue is this. In the bureaucracy, there's only single track, that is career bureaucrats. You enter office, for example, I become governor, so I enter office. Everyone who works in the bureaucracy is people who have been working for the previous governors for 20 to 30 years, and they have served numerous governors. They have been doing things the way they like to do for so many years. And you're coming in with idea of change, okay? And then you're not having the authority to basically bring in people that you know will be able to deliver and understand what has been in the campaign promises. So, it is an interesting situation. You enter office, you're the only person that is new. So you enter office as, as new governors, and you're the only person who is new. The rest has been there for so many years, and you're talking, uh, you know, I have these campaign promises. Uh, please deliver. And everyone, yes, sir, we'll deliver. Okay? And then what are the promises? These are the list of promises. Can you imagine campaign promises being given to bureaucracy that have been doing things, the same things for so many years, and expect bureaucracy to make that change immediately? That's tough. Imagine at the national level, I'm managing Jakarta, and Jakarta has 180,000 employees. 60,000 employees were state employees called ASN, 
and the 120,000 employees were non-state employee but employee of, 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 of Jakarta. So 180,000 and the budget is around 80 trillion rupiah. So you have that much resources, you have 180,000 people to manage, and you have 11 million populations you have to take care. And then you enter office on your own. You bring in, you, you, you think you're gonna bring in newness. That is a big challenge. And I can tell you that is being experienced by all locally elected leaders, be it mayors, be it region or governors across Indonesia. Now, allow me to share our experience. How do I deal with this? How do I, how do we uh, go about this? So I sort of uh, make this uh, simple equations. There is this electoral process which is happening and it produced leaders. I had 23 campaign promises, and then I'm facing bureaucracy. I bring, I tr translate it into 75 programs, and translate it into 280 activities, with a budget of plus minus 80 trillion uh, rupiah. How do we go about this? So I started having comparative uh, assessment. This is done before I started the job. As soon as we won the elections, we start, uh, we established a team called Team Synchronisasi, a synchronizing team. Or at the national level, it used to be called transition team. What does it do? It translated campaign promises into programs and those programs translated into activities so that it is, uh, it is something understandably easy by the bureaucracy to adopt. Translating that needs a unit and it is called governor's delivery unit. Okay, and I think in many countries you have examples of uh, similar to this. Uh, So we, we did studies on where are delivery units across the globe that has been practiced, which are best uh, for us to reflect. And we are, we are seeing quite a few uh, in Europe, uh, there are the case of Albania, Romania, Serbia, and UK, and we adopted the UK model in the prime minister delivery unit. And we adopted that. In Asia, there's quite a few too. Uh, in Brunei, in India, uh, Indonesia used to have UKP4 uh, in the past. And then uh, in Malaysia, in Pakistan, and, and all other uh, places. But anyway, so we established what is called delivery unit, often uh, famously known as TGUPP. Tim Gubernur untuk percepatan pembangunan. And this delivery unit is the one that translated all campaign promises into programs, into activities, so that it can be easily inserted into programs at various different departments and bodies across Jakarta government. So, uh, this is the, the, uh, the government delivery uh, unit at the, uh, in, in UK, uh, Tony Blair uh, Prime Minister Delivery Units. Uh, that was our model when we refer uh, in, the, in the process of uh, development. And just a minute, there we go. So we were, we are trying to make sure that campaign promises is not forgotten by the leader itself and not forgotten by the general public and not uh, gone in the way, in the bureaucracy. Because the bureaucracy has already had so many existing programs. So we want to make sure it is happening. So the way it works is 
we translated our promise into perjanjian kerja, performance, uh, key performance indicators, all of them. And everyone in our bureaucracy, the first echelon, second echelon, they're signing a contract with the governors. Uh, these are things that you have to deliver. These are things that you have to uh, undertake. And this is the one. This is one example. And we have uh, 78 issues in there. And then, these are translated into activities that is being monitored on a monthly basis. So every month, they're being monitored. And when they, you know, our, our bureaucrats in Jakarta, when they hear F8K, Form 8K, they know, they know exactly this is a monitoring system established to ensure that the work is delivered. Uh, and this is by no means as a, a sort of a threatening, but it is more like, uh, let's do it in a collaborative way. And it is linked to their monthly take home pay. So you have to deliver. If you don't deliver, there is the reductions in terms of uh, take home pay. Not salary, because the salary, we cannot adjust the salary. But in Indonesia, you have salary and then you have tunjangan kinerja. The name itself says kinerja, which is performance. So it's performance based income or bonuses. If you don't deliver, why should the people pay that much? So there is that adjustment needs to be made. And then we built an achievement monitoring tools uh, that we are able to see how, what percentage of our project or our programs is being completed, how many were not in target, how many were not reporting, and all of that. So this is created in order to make sure that all campaign promises were delivered. And I can, I can uh, with, I mean, provide a, a testimony to you that so many of us who are in office don't have the tools, don't have the means, don't have the capacity to monitor whether our campaign promises are being delivered or not. And it is an issue in our democracy. If we don't provide this kind of approach, we may be relying simply on creating positive public perceptions about the leadership, but not on truly addressing uh, issues in a technocratic way. And I think we need to make sure that our democracy is really delivering a project, uh, delivering uh, uh, goods that is in the, in, the, in, the, in the interest and also that was uh, promised during the campaign. This is just one illustration that I would like to share. This is being discussed within our office that all of these uh, programs in Jakarta. So, then usually the public discuss this issue. This is an issue that has political impact and this is the issue that has development impact. This is an area that usually people talk about. Okay. And then we have also things that is important for development, but people don't talk about it. I'll give you an example. The reform and education, the performance management, the meritocratic system, or the organizational culture, you know, uh, uh, the early education. These are all important issues for development, but the public is less attention given. So we created this quadrant. We put issues depending on how high is the political impact and how big is the number of development impact. And what we like to do is we like to address all of this all. If we, are, if we don't create this kind of matrix and we don't provide instrument in terms of ensuring it is being delivered, you know what may happen? There are so many things we are not on this diagram will be forgotten. Because we tend to pay more attention on the issues that general public cares about. 
despite the fact it is important or not important, and would like to address is all of them. So we adopted this approach, and with that we're happy to, you know, if I may uh, share uh, with you that in in four years we're able to do major reforms on several area. Give you one example in the area of uh, infrastructure for mobility, for example. Jakarta has many uh, challenges, and if you do survey to the, pu the public survey on issues that matters to you, there are two cluster. One is household issues, and two is public conversation, issues that matters in the public conversation. In the public conversations, issue that matters is one, flood, two, traffic congestions, three, disparities or social cohesion. But at the family level, issue that matters, one, is cost of living, number two, health services, number three, education. So there is this mismatch about what public talk about and what family uh, would like to see in terms of change. And we in, in government could not just address one or the other. We need to address all of them. So I'll give you one example with regard to cost of living. Cost of living in Jakarta is high and if we break down cost of living into several components, then the components can be linked to uh, the issue of the public. This is cost of living. This include, majority, is mobility, food, housing, those are the basic, and etc. And then on the other hand, we have an issue of traffic congestions. And when we try to solve these two, let's look at mobility. The cost of mobility in Jakarta could reach up to 30% of family spending. So if you have a kids, two kids, and you have to do uh, 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 you have to take them to schools, you have to take them to work, and that would cost up to 30%. On the other hand, traffic in Jakarta, we have 11 million motorcycles. We have 3 million uh, four wheelers. So you can imagine, because uh, everyone is taking mo their own motorcycles, everyone is driving their own car, then we have traffic congestions, and at the family level, you have high spending for transportations. So our breakthrough was to create public transport. Not so much create in terms of new public transport, but to integrate public transport. And to do this, it is not possible for the governors to do it alone. That delivery unit matters a lot in the executions of that idea. The idea is, for so many years, government have not been providing facility for mobility in the city. We let our citizen to purchase their car, to purchase their motorcycles, we are, we are giving easy credit opportunities so you can finance it on your own. But we're not providing the public transport. And what we do is we're converting that. So for that, what we're doing is uh, expand the uh, BRT system integrate all mode of transportations into an integrated system, which is called uh, Jaklinko, and that anyone can go from one place to another within our city in one payment. So 10,000 rupiah, you can go anywhere and you can transfer anywhere within three hours. And when we did that uh, in the early 2018, uh, within two years, 
daily riderships of our public transport increased from 350,000 to 1 million per day. Tripled in two years. We hope this trend to continue because Jakarta needs to have around 4 million people taking public transport in order to have better traffic uh, management in our city. So far, we have reached 1 million people uh, per day uh, for our daily ridership. And with that approach, uh, we are seeing reductions of family spending. We want to make uh, family spending for mobility go as low as 8%, from 30% to 8%. And that is our target at the family level. And at the, at the uh, macro level, we have been seeing uh, reductions of traffic congestions. Jakarta, according to TomTom -Tom Traffic Index, was ranked third most congested city in the year 2017. And then we dropped to number seven, and then we dropped to number 10. Uh, on the top 10, and every ranking is good, except traffic congestion. I mean, you don't want to be on the top 10 on, on, uh, on top on traffic congestion. So we want to get out of that uh, top 10. So we're able to reach number 34, and last year we were number 46. So we dropped from number three in terms of most congested city, dropped to number 46. And daily ridership tripled. And then coverage of public transport, it used to be around 40% in Jakarta, now it's 90%. And now you can take uh, micro buses uh, anywhere, and it is integrated with the BRT, integrated with the MRT. Now, how that was done? It was done because there is this delivery unit that is monitoring the work every week and providing assessment every month. Without that, this process would never happen because it requires detailed work uh, to have that uh, delivered. And I must say, the process is not simple. That when I had the first meeting with all uh, public transport operators, which has been there for so many years, it was one of the most heated meetings I ever attended uh, with the operators of, of our public transport, the Copaja, the, the Metro Mini operators, and all of that. And then we invite them to work together. The negotiations takes more than six months, more than 70 meetings of negotiations with all operators. And that could never happen if we only relied on the bureaucrats to do it. So we have to work together. So the, the governor's delivery unit, the TGUPP, was instrumental in ensuring the process is going in the right directions and achieving the target. So from these uh, examples, if I may share, that political process does not automatically translate it into bureaucratic process. You have to have a bridge to actually ensure that all political promises translate it into technocratic program and that technocratic program can be executed by the bureaucracy. So the execution is at the bureaucracy level. Now, uh, with that, we're happy uh, to see that so many programs, so many promises in Jakarta were able to be delivered. Not because of anything, but because the system was created to deliver. If we didn't do that, it would be very difficult to make adjustment in our budget. It would be very difficult to adopt new program because there is no way one person in government, the governors, simply giving list of programs and then the bureaucracy immediately translated into program. It won't work that way. And I think this is what is missing uh, in our bureaucratic uh, reform, that we have not made adjustment in the bureaucracy, we have not provide avenue for democratic promises, for democratic processes to be adopted in the delivery at, by the bureaucracy. So 
with that, uh, let me uh, give you one uh, illustration about the works that was done by the PDU just a minute. Here we go. There are three. So this is uh, my message to the delivery units. Uh, number one is, oh, hold on a minute. Okay. Number one is with regard to vision alignment. Number two, strategic response and stakeholders uh, management. So this is the most important aspect. Aligning governors and bureaucratic visions into one, and then bridging bureaucrats with the governors, and ask more and less tell. So listen, ask questions, rather than give instructions. So with that, uh, we're able uh, to see many of our promises were, were delivered. So this is a book in which we outline detailed uh, achievements in terms of campaign promises into uh, real delivery at the, at the uh, city level. And I do think that if we are serious in making sure democracy works, it is, Im it is important to build that bridge. And Jakarta can serve as an example and I'm in actually inviting a researcher uh, to do that. Uh, and now many uh, mayors, uh, head of regions, uh, governors, were coming to Jakarta to learn how can we create a delivery unit that is truly functional. To give you an illustration about the delivery unit, we have 57 people working in the delivery unit. Uh, with me is Pak pa Amin. Pak Amin, you can may raise. This is Pak Amin Subakti. Uh, he is the chairman of the delivery unit. Uh, previously, he was the deputy director of BRR, the Aceh Reconstruction Project. And then he works as director to uh, state-owned enterprise PLN. And then I recruited him to work. And the design for this, this uh, delivery uh, units and also the KPI, uh, I recruited someone from PWC, a director that focuses on organizational change on performance indicators measurement. So we recruited through professionals from PwC to actually work for us and full time to translate all these campaign promises into measurable project programs. And all these 57 people who are working uh, for us uh, in the government of Jakarta, I can say almost all of them were technocratic oriented, Almost all of them have a professional background and they could easily get a job in the marketplace. But they decided to work for, for government for these purposes. And we're happy uh, to see this maybe as, as a model. So allow me to end it uh, here and I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, you may have. And, but again, the idea is in a country like Indonesia, where the hope for democracy is very high, the expectations for elected officials are very high, if we don't have the means to translate that into bureaucratic process, then promises could be forgotten and that we will not be able to be, uh, to be, counted, uh, to be taken accountable for many of those promises if we don't have the means to uh, translate that into uh, actions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eve Warburton. I'm the director of the Indonesia Institute, uh, and I'm also a research fellow at the Department of Political and Social Change. And um, it's a huge honour and a pleasure to be moderating this Q&A session with Dr. Baswedan. Uh, let me begin by, first of all, thanking you very much for an incredibly detailed, thorough and insightful and fascinating um, lecture on the sort of the, the mechanics of delivering programs at the, at the, government, the Jakarta government level. Um, so, th this um, 
part of our lecture will um, be structured mainly around inviting you all to ask your questions to Dr. Buswaden. He's been very generous in allowing us plenty of time uh, to engage with the audience. Um, I might begin by starting things off and, and then uh, while you guys all sort of think of your questions and I would um, emphasize that you please uh, think of very brief, succinct questions because we have a very large audience tonight um, and I'll invite you to just ask one question. Um, so while you're thinking of your questions, um, I might start. Um, uh, Dr. Baswedan, it was a fascinating talk and it was very focused on the technocratic aspects of delivering campaign promises. Um, but the title of your talk did involve the word democracy. Uh, so what I might ask you is how democratic institutions at the Jakarta level, things like rights protections, uh, things like um, you know uh, checks on accountability, the things that we normally associate with democratic uh, government. How did you manage, protect, and support those sorts of institutions during your tenure, and how important were they for delivering the sorts of programs um, that you've outlined here tonight? Sure, thank you, Eve. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, democracy is not only uh, about election but also about upholding values. And those values include, some of them, a respect for freedom of expressions. And, and then two, transparency, for example, accountability. So some of those uh, values. And, and, and we tried our best uh, to uphold that. And give you example, the freedom of expressions. Uh, being in government in Jakarta is always noisy situations, whoever is the governor, because the social media engagement is very high, all media are in Jakarta, so small things could be trending topics if it happens in Jakarta. And it could attract uh, attentions across Indonesia. And having that is a true benefit to us. What happened is we are able to get quick response from the general public about what we're doing. So we don't see this as a problem, but we are seeing this as an opportunity to get things better, to improve things by having public engagement on everything that we're doing. It could come out in form of criticism. But for us, in democracy, criticism is normal and should be respected. And in fact, we benefited from that. So freedom of expression is there. And one indication is this. We, are nev we never uh, prosecute anyone or report anyone to the police or anything about whatever they're saying to the governor of Jakarta or to the governor of Jakarta. We treated this as respect to freedom of expression. And then number two is creating uh, an environment of peacefulness and respect to all uh, groups in our society. And that is also something that we seriously uh, focus on, ensuring that all groups in Jakarta were given equal opportunity, were given equal treatment as part of our value to democracy. And we're happy to report that the Democratic Index of Jakarta has always been first in the country, uh, beginning in 2018 and, 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 and so forth. So uh, even when there is an objective measurement about our democracy, we serve as one of the highest uh, in, in Indonesia. And I do think that having transparency, having public engagement is key. And if I may share some of our approach, what is called collaboracy, collaborations. We even label our city, Jakarta, a city of collaborations. And the reason was simple. I used to be outside government, and I'd like to help government. But often, government don't want our help. I mean, they, you know, when we started in Indonesia Mengajar, I come to Kabupaten, and the Kabupaten said, no, 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 we don't want you. Uh, we, we, we're able to handle this. You know, uh, they were seeing us more like someone who may be disturbing the process as a disturbance. And on the other hand, when I enter government, I'm seeing from within that what we have in government is authority, resources, but we, what we're lack of is 
innovations, creativity, network, grounded experience. Many of us didn't have that. And Jakarta is the city where, you know, best talents were there. There is no other city in Indonesia that have private sector as many as Jakarta. Uh, think tanks as many as Jakarta. A university as many as Jakarta, or NGOs as many as Jakarta. Why should we in government do everything on our own? Why don't we invite them to join and work together? And this is again the principle of democracy. So I mentioned earlier about the reform on transportations. In fact, we are inviting NGOs, think tanks from Jakarta as well as from international to work together with us. So many of the reform that we're doing, the idea didn't come directly from us, but from our partners. And when they're involved, they are also seeing what we're doing. They're also monitoring what the bureaucracy is doing, and they're giving feedbacks things that didn't, they didn't like, things that they criticized, it's a thing that is not right, they report it to us. And yes, it, it, it requires extra energy, but at the end, we improve the quality of governance and the delivery of that process. Thank you, Thank you very much, Buck. Okay, so questions from the audience. I've got Nava here, Hal Hill, and the gentleman there at the back with the shirt on there. So that's three, and we'll take three at once if we can. So one microphone. <coughs> Nava, one up here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pa Anis, for the presentation. My name is Nava. I'm a PhD student here. Over the course of my field work, I was researching about Islamist groups, alumni of the 212 movement, and especially the, the women activists. And, you know, I got all the updates about all your achievements from my uh, respondents. And so they are some of your biggest fans. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, so, you know, when I asked them, you know, why do you work so hard for Pa'ani's campaign? Because they are volunteers for, you know, so but Anis, they, they really work laboriously day and night, unpaid for the success of your campaign. And when I asked them, you know, what do you hope uh, from Pa'ani's? And they said, first, they want clean government, governance, and then uh, they want you, they also believe that you would impose a kind of Islamic orthodoxy and Sharia-based um, moral values. To what extent and how would you translate those demands uh, into your policies? Thank you. Just an easy one to start. Um, <laughs> and um, yes, and then Hal Hill. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Budi. I came all the way from Jogja, Mas. Um, I want to be uh, straightforward. So uh, this is in relation to next year, yeah? when you, the only person now being endorsed by Pak Surya Palo. So yesterday, Pak uh, Prabowo met with Pak Surya Palo, and in the press conference, Pak Surya Palo mentioned, of course, we need to be polite and still working together for future Indonesia. But Pak Prabowo said that um, if um, Anis running for uh, president, uh, this is Pak Prabowo words yesterday, okay, I'm willing to fight against him. So my question, would you be uh, willing to fight against him in the next election? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Professor Hal Hill, yes, please. Uh, uh, Pa'ani, selamat datang. Very nice to see you again. Thank you for your interesting talk. Um, by the way, I think you're being too modest. Um, your city is 11 million people, but as I understand it, it doubles to the Australian population size during the, during the day. So you've got an even bigger job than you talked about. So let me, if, if I may ask you an economics question, since I first met you as an economics student at Gajamara. So, and your prospective career looking forward. So the Indonesian economy has done quite well during the democratic era, the last 25 years. And I'd argue, I think a lot of people argue also, that one of the reasons is that the key economics positions have been sort of insulated or outside the political process. That is, the, the two key posts, Menteri Kuwangan and Bank Indonesia Governor, have typically been technocratic people, exemplified currently by Ibu Sri Mulyani and pa Peri Wajo. So that seems to me a crucial part of the Indonesian political economy construct in the democratic era. Looking forward, would that be your uh, intention to keep that kind of tradition going? 
Thank you very much and welcome again. Islamists, Pak Prabowo, and the economy, 2024. <laughs> you have five minutes. <laughs> this is so Canberra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was quiet. I, 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 you know, when I, pa Anil Kumar, uh, thanks for coming. Usually, quiet audience like this is in Singapore, but okay. But it was it was quiet uh, here. Uh, anyway, the first questions uh, with regard to aspirations. I've received many aspirations, and when, when I'm working as governors, then I have a uh, few principles that I uphold when making decisions. What are the first one? First is justice to all, the principle of justice. Number two, common sense has to be there. Okay. Number three is uh, public interest. And number four is rules and regulations and undang-undang. Okay? So I didn't work the other way around, Pak. Because most of us in government will be working the other way around. Number one is following rules and regulations. But sometimes they're not making sense. Okay? And sometimes they're not in the public interest. And sometimes it doesn't reflect the principle of justice. So you know, our approach has been like that. So principle of justice and then common sense, akal sehat and then public interest, and then rules and regulations. So with that, I believe that's the very principles of Islam too, is justice. So that has been our approach. And if you are witnessing uh, Jakarta in the past five years, uh, we try to always ensure that four principle is being adopted. So it's not specifically only for a certain religious group, but also to, to all. And that has been uh, the approach. And I like to carry on that approach uh, toward the future. Second question. I think I really need to listen to the quote, Pa. But, but, but uh, would you be willing to fight against Pa Prabowo? That was the question, right? <laughs> what do you think, Pa? <laughs> If, if I may address, I think uh, toward the future of Indonesia, we'll, we'll see uh, who will be on the tickets. We don't know yet. And I myself, if, if I were asked uh, six months ago, I never expected the nomination come that early. You know, I always thought that presidential nominations would perhaps start around May and June this year. That was, you know, my thinking, and that's why after I finish my term in October, I like to take a break, uh, perhaps sabbatical, and do a little bit of work before election cycles. And I wasn't sure which directions I will be going. I may be going for re-election for Jakarta, which is also next year, but it can also be a national elections. And I was always being frank. I wasn't sure why, because I'm not the leader of political party. I cannot nominate myself through political parties. For the gubernatorial elections, non-partisan candidate is possible. But for, in, for the presidential elections, there is no uh, non-partisan candidate. So it has to be nominated by political party. However, we know that you know it's. We know that Nasdem nominated in October, and then last month, uh, PKS and then Democrats. So here I am, uh, non-partisan person nominated by three political party, and yet some party leaders have not yet getting nomination in term of minimum twenty percent. So I think toward the futures. Uh, you have to be ready uh, to sort of uh, compete with anyone and present your idea, present your records, and let uh, the public of Indonesia decide which one they're going to take. Pahol Hill. Same approach, Pak, that I've been doing uh, in Jakarta. And that's why I often uh, ask the general public 
to not only ask what will you be doing in the future, because you can provide any answer with regard to futures, because it's not happening yet. But I would suggest to all of us here, whenever you ask questions, ask what have you been doing, what have you done in the past on similar case. I entered Jakarta uh, as an elected governor, and then you have leaders of departments, agencies, bodies, CEOs of state-owned enterprises. I did assessment to their performance. If they are performing well, then no replacement were needed. They can continue the job. And many of our directors were appointed by my predecessors, and they're still doing their job until today. The reason is because they delivered. So the approach when it comes to government, you have to really uh, give values to technocracy over politics. Now, where is the political components? The political components is on the agenda that needs to be delivered. Those are the promise that needs to be delivered. So you may be the head of the transportation department and you have been doing more of managing private vehicles. New governors come in and say you have to manage public transportation now. You deliver it, but this is the content. This is the political agenda that you need to deliver. But who delivers it? The technocrats. And uh, so that was something that I have adopted in the past, and I think we will uh, value that in the future. And on the other hand, when it comes to uh, cabinet ministries, there are portion which political parties would like to have their, their candidates and their people to be in. And I think that's the reality of politics everywhere. What is important for the leadership is to have clear vision Translate it into clear agenda, translate it into clear KPIs, and then have a unit that is doing the monitoring of the execution. So the individuals could come from anywhere, anywhere. But if you don't have that delivery units that monitor that, many of those promises, many of those vision agenda could be lost on the way. Now, Indonesia benefited from the fact that we have technocrats uh, in the ministerial uh, post. However, that doesn't guarantee you that they will be doing what the leaders wanted to do. They, they will not be partisan, but that doesn't mean non-partisanship is according to the agenda of the leaders. So I think this is two different things, but having the technocrat is good, but having clear agenda, clear priorities, and clear KPIs is as important. Otherwise, non-partisanship could go on their own way, not in the way that the leaders is envisioning. Begitu, Pak Holil. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Um, we are actually on time at seven o'clock. I'm okay. Yeah. You're okay. Um, if anyone does need to leave, that's fine. But um, Pa Anis has been very generous and is happy just to go a little bit over time because we're running a bit late. So um, other questions, if we could keep them super, super brief. This gentleman here was so fast, I have to give him the microphone. Um, uh, Pat Terry over here. Um, and then we'll see how we go for time. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Baswedan. My name is Tegu. I'm currently uh, studying strategic studies. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that is perhaps a bit early. It's also in regards to 2024. Uh, as you are one of the possible candidates for the running election at 2024, uh, can I please get some of your thoughts uh, on Indonesia's defense policy because if you are if you will be running for 2024 uh, I'd like to know uh, how your views on Indonesia's defense policy will be thank you you know one is asking whether I'm challenging two is asking what's the Indonesian defense policy the same person actually referred to yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we might just take one more to sure. Pa Anis, and then we'll, uh, yes. Hello, Pa Anis. Thank you very much for the review of how you ran Jakarta 
according to your election promises. But one thing you didn't deal with in election promises was COVID. Could you tell us how you dealt with what was probably the biggest blow to Jakarta's public health in many years with COVID? His name is again? That's Terry Hall. But, but Terry, yep. Okay, first uh, questions with regard to uh, security. In fact, in the past two days, I've been discussing so many uh, uh, balance of power issues uh, in in the region, uh, but overall, uh, you know, I I could not go on to detail at this point, but we'd like to see our uh, defense capacity able to maintain territorial integrity of Indonesia, and especially in places where potential uh, frictions can take place, such as uh, South uh, China Sea. So we'd like to have uh, our capacity uh, enough to ensure territorial uh, integrity. Number two, Pak Terry, uh, terima kasih. COVID is something that, yes, we didn't predict. Uh, and I must say it was one of the the deepest leadership learning experience is one when, when we deal with uh, COVID, uh, and we we work uh, immediately with scholars. So, if I may say, our approach in Jakarta in dealing with COVID was this: I involve in international mayors associations like C40s. So, in early January. On 2020, early February, mayors were having meetings. I involved in those meetings. During those meetings, they were sharing stories about the severity of the problems in their cities. So, mayors of uh, Seoul, mayors of Tehran, Milan, you know, some of these mayors were sharing to us the difficulties they're having. And we learned that early. And then we started to have task force. We, we established a task force before the national government established a task force. And we had meetings with the immigration services, with the intelligence, with the travel bureau, inviting them. We're trying to evaluate how many people were coming from China at that time. This is the month of January and February. And we start reporting our testing result to the national uh, government in uh, to, to the Ministry of Health. And this was a situation where uh, we have to decide how to go in handling this crisis. And we thought the key word to handle this is trust. We have to have the trust of the public to government because the epidemiologists were telling us it's not going to be short, it can be a year, it can be two years, it can be longer than that. We didn't know that. So number one that is important, public need to trust us in government. And that is our principles. So in order to gain trust, we are being transparent, we are telling exactly what is happening to the public, we are telling exactly what they need to do. Uh, because we would like to manage that trust. And trust, there's three components to that. One is you need to appear, you need to send a message that you're competent. Number two, you have to have integrity. Transparency is key component to integrity. And number three, you have to be intimate to the problem. Intimacy is key. So that was our approach. And often, when we adopt that principle, we are not always in line with the approach of the national health policy especially with the Ministry of Health. Give you one example. We send samples of our patients in hospitals to the Ministry of Health, and they always come back, they never come back to us. So we didn't know whether this is positive or negative. We have sent quite a few, I mean, more than 200, I believe, by early March. So I decided in, in March 1st to go public saying we have submitted uh, PDP, PDP at that time, 
uh, to the Ministry of Health, but we are not receiving response. And uh, the Minister of Health was responding in a negative way, saying that there is no case at all. Uh, a day later, it was announced the first two cases uh, of, 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 of COVID at that time. And then Jakarta government is the only government that manages funeral services and cemetery. Average funeral services for the past two years, so 2018, 2019, monthly average is 2,700 services. In the month of March, jumped to 4,300, right? And the month of April, it reached uh, 4,500. This is no small numbers in terms of funeral services. Something must have gone wrong. And then we're looking at the bills in the hospitals. The pneumonia bills doubled. Uh, something must have been wrong. And, and we're in the situation in which, on the one hand, you're listening to mayors across the globe saying there is a problem. On the other hand, we're talking to the Ministry of Health who are trying to isolate this problem and say, you know, this is not a big deal. And then you're talking to the general publics who are worrisome. And that was the time that we decide we will go public, we will uh, create our own policies and move forward with bold policies on protecting our citizen. We may not be popular, but we told, I told our team, let's not worry about what people write about us today, what the social media says about us, let's worry about what historian will be writing about us in the future, because that's what matters. So that's the approach. And I'm glad that a year later, our policy and the national government policy is synchronized. But it takes a few months for that approach uh, to, 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 to a synchronized approach uh, to happen.